Our Father, we are certainly grateful and very thankful for what this weekend represents as a Memorial Day in our country of the men and women who ultimately paid the ultimate sacrifice that we can do what we do today. Lord, I pray that everything that we do today is all about you. My heart's prayer is that people will see you high and lifted up above everything else. Thank you, Lord, for the folk that are here. I pray that you'll bless all that we do now in Christ's name. Amen. The sight before us is that of a strong and nation that stands in silence and remembers those who were loved and who in return loved their countrymen enough to die for them. Yet we must try to honor them, not for their sakes alone, but for our own. And if words cannot repay the debt we owe these men, surely with our actions, we must strive to keep faith with them and with a vision that led them to battle and a final sacrifice. Our first obligation to them and ourselves is plain enough. The United States and the freedom for which it stands, the freedom for which they died, must endure and prosper. Their lives remind us that freedom is not bought cheaply. It has a cost. The willingness of some to give their lives so that others might live never fails to evoke in us a sense of wonder and mystery, and how they must have wished, in all the ugliness that war brings, that no other generation of young men to follow would have to undergo that same experience. As we honor their memory today, let us pledge that their lives, their sacrifices, their valor shall be justified and remembered for as long as God gives life to this nation. And let us also pledge to do our utmost to carry out what must have been their wish, that no other generation of young men will ever have to share their experiences and repeat their sacrifice.
as we say our pledges to our flag, the American flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with life lifted for all. Now to the Christian flag. I pledge allegiance to the Christian flag and to the Savior for which it stands. One Savior, crucified and risen and coming again with life and liberty to all who believe. To God's holy word, I pledge allegiance to the Bible, God's holy word. I will make it a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And I'll hide his words in my heart that I might not sin against God. Kids, y'all can go out that middle door. You lead the way. There you go. Thank you for being down here. Thank you for doing so good. Most of you. Let's sing this morning. Praise Him, praise Him. You lift your voice with us. Words are on the screen. Praise Him, praise Him, Jesus our blessed Redeemer. Sing the word His wonderful love proclaim. Hail Him, hail Him. I am star changes in glory. Strength and honor. Give to His holy name. Guard his children in his arms, he carries them all day long. Praise him, praise him, tell of his excellent greatness. Praise him, praise him, ever in joyful soul. I may be catching our ushers off guard, guys. Uh, Bobby, if I'm caught you off guard, I apologize. But I know we have at least one visitor here. Anybody else here today for the very, very first time? Would you do me a favor and raise your hand up high? Anywhere? Am I missing any other than this young lady here? And if y'all recognize her, she is from Ingalls. Ray had uh, goes down there to Ingalls on a regular basis and invited her and some others. And we are so proud that uh, that you came. Did they by chance give you a visitor's packet? Is anybody giving you? We'll get you something. You just you just hold tight, and I promise you that we'll get you something. Uh, our first, well, it's a great, great morning. Yeah. I hope none of y'all are going to go to heaven today. But if you do, it's a great, great morning to go. Amen? Any morning. Here we go. Well, it's a great, great morning. Your first day in heaven. When you realize your worry days are true.
there. Sometimes anything would beat what we face down here in life, you know. But won't it be wonderful there? Here we go. Won't it be wonderful there? Having no burden to bear. You know, I've heard people say before that, uh, you know, when we were talking about praying to God and talking to God, I've heard people use the excuse, oh, it doesn't do any good. I, God doesn't want to hear from me. Well, that, that's, that's the farthest thing from the truth. God wants to hear from us. God wants to, to commune with us. And um, let, me, let me ask you parents, don't y'all like for your kids to talk to you? Well, we wish they'd talk more often. Instead, we get that cold shoulder or that they want to ignore us and all that. But our Heavenly Father wants to talk to us. And the song we're going to do this morning says that it pays to pray. Because He wants to hear from us. He wants to give us things. The Bible says that He'll give us our heart's desires if we ask for the right reason. Unfortunately, a lot of people are praying for things from their Heavenly Father that aren't for the right reason. But it does pay to pray. And I challenge you this morning 
Next time you run into a difficulty in life or you need some advice, don't Google it. Got it. Ask God about it. He'll give you the right answer. You listen. tempted to quit praying you feel he's never listening the time has come for you to make a choice do you stop believing forget what you've been seeking or do you
Stand with us one last time, if you would. We'll let our choir go down and our ushers come in and take today's offering. Jesus loves even me, the song says. I'm glad he loves me this morning. I am so glad that our Father in heaven tells of the love in the book he has given. Wonderful things in the Bible I see. This is the dearest that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Sing the last. Oh, if there's only one song I can sing, when in the beauty I see the great King, this shall my song in eternity be. Oh, what a wonder that Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me. I am so glad that Jesus loves me. Jesus loves even me. Morning, guys. How are y'all? Good? Oliver, you look sharp this morning. Did y'all realize we have one of the grandchildren, Becky and Terry? Three of them. That's not Molly, is it? Molly, you've gotten so big, I didn't recognize you. I thank you for your help today. Okay? All of y'all. Scary. But Oliver, you look sharp. You know, let's pray. Father, thank you so, so much for your faithfulness. Thank you for how you meet needs in the life of our church. I am in awe for all these years how faithful that you've been in working through your folk now. In Christ's name, amen. Keith, you had your hands full with Molly, didn't you? <laughs> she belongs to him. It's not, that's not mine. Okay. Father, thank you for the offering today. Thank you for the faithfulness of our folk. In Christ's name, amen. Let me make a, a couple of announcements I didn't have a chance to before because of the schedule of our service. 
Uh, there's a Bible verse that's found in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2. The Bible says this, Paul was writing to the people of Corinth. He says, it's required in stewards that a man be found faithful. It's required, that means that's something God expects in stewards. Steward is one who's in control of his master's uh, stuff. Okay? And, uh, you know, we've made change of late uh, with a youth pastor, and Chris stepped up to do that. But Chris can't do it by himself, okay? Uh, Chris had a position of a ch children's ministry leader. Now he's a youth pastor so that kind of left an opening. Matlin, that was helping before, is now going to go back to school, and she's getting a degree at school and also <clears throat> working in some local schools. So that's another thing that's going on that kind of took her away from helping along that line. So the point is simply this. We need some of you to step up. We need some of you that normally go to Sunday school class, whether it be my class or Chuck and, and Terry's class or the couple's class, where, it doesn't matter. You've got to stop being comfortable in your class and step up and do some things. Otherwise, <clears throat> we're not going to have anybody to work with those kids upstairs. So I want to encourage you, if you would, to step up to, along that line. Uh, we've got a couple of positions in Sunday school that we could use, and I'm sure to help during a children's church and such as that. A couple other things, uh, with the college and career age group, uh, if you are of that age group, if you graduated this year, going into a career, uh, if you've been there for a while, you know, and such as that, Sue Ann and I were talking about it, and we would like to do some things with that age group. Uh, you say, well, what is an age group of college and career? Well, it's anybody out of high school that maybe has started a career, whatever it may be. You could be out of high school a number of years. Now, I don't mean if you've been out of high school 30 years. That's not what I'm talking about. But just a few years uh, that you could uh, come and fellowship with us. We, we want to make a position for you. If you're single, uh, I mean, you're, you're welcome to come. Uh, we're going to meet this Friday night, be our first get-together. We're going to meet uh, down at a Mexican restaurant. It's right next to Publix in Monroe, that new shopping center. It's on me. I'll buy you supper. You don't, it won't cost you a thing. All you have to do is show up. And I'd love for you to come. We're going to let you give you an idea of some things that we would like to do. That age group is always wanting to do things. And I understand it, you know. And we want to try to provide a, a situation where you can do some good things, some godly things. So we'll talk about it more uh, when we meet down there Friday night. If you got any questions, just feel free to give me a call or Miss Sue Ann a call, and we'll do that. And lastly, don't forget, no service tonight, okay? We don't do that. On, we don't have a Sunday night service on Memorial Day weekend. We've got so many folk today gone on vacation, but we don't do that on Memorial or Mother's Day or Father's Day. So no service tonight. I uh, hope you'll keep that in mind. Oh, one last thing. We're going to have a work day here at church. We do this usually once a year. On June 8th, uh, June 8th, uh, inside and out. That means we got a place for ladies and gentlemen to help, and we need to do this less, uh, desperately. That's a Saturday, June 8th, from 10 to 12. Okay. Jim's going to come and sing for us this morning. Uh, I like the title of this song. It, it ought to be a, a, a message for each of us, a challenge for each of us. We ought to brag on Jesus every chance we get. You listen to the song. Curse to me. We all seem to have a testimony of a time when Jesus helped us up and showed to us his mercy. Now we've gathered here to silence the noise of what other voices are saying. Let's drown them out by talking about our wonderful Savior, our wonderful Savior. So let's take turns, brag it on Jesus. I'll be the first to 
tell what he's done. He brought me back from the edge of destruction and he gave me a life that I don't deserve. Could I take a moment to talk of his grace, how his mercy found me when I ran away? I know he desires the praise of his people, so let's take turns bragging on Jesus. I think of what I could have been if he had never saved me. There's a joy no one can take away to think of all he gave me. I could sing all day and rejoice all night and still wouldn't be quite enough. The praise is due. We'll give it to you, the Lord God Almighty. You're the Lord God Almighty. So let's take turns bragging on Jesus. I'll be the first to tell what he's done. He brought me back from the edge of destruction and he gave me a life that I don't deserve. Could I take a moment to talk of his grace, how his mercy found me when I ran away? I know he desires the praise of his people, so let's take turns bragging on Jesus. Has he been good to anybody else? If he has just raise your hands if he's been good to anybody else if he has just raise your hands let's take turns bragging on Jesus I'll be the first to tell what he's done he brought me back from the edge of destruction and he gave me a life could I take a moment to talk of his grace, how his mercy found me when I ran away? I know he desires the praise of his people, so let's take turns bragging on Jesus. Oh. You know, for the life of me, I've never figured out why they give him a microphone. God knows he doesn't need one. Take your Bibles, if you would, and go with me to the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter number 11. I'm going to read a few verses, starting with verse 32. And probably uh, several of the verses that most of y'all don't read. In all honesty, you normally stop somewhere before you ever get to verse 32. But there is so much faith found in verses 32 through verse 40 about the faithfulness of people and how good God's been and how good God is in our hearts and lives, not only back then, but in our lives today. So I'll, I'll make a couple of comments as I, as I read along here. And then we'll pray. The writer of Hebrews says, begin with verse 32, And what shall I more say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Japheth and of David and also of Samuel and of the prophets. All of, all of these men listed in this verse held positions of power and positions of authority. But they were being recognized for what each one had accomplished by their faith in God. Chapter 11 of Hebrews is all about faith. It's not about an accomplishment and such as that other than the faith that you had in order for God to accomplish what God accomplished through you. When he made mention of Samuel there, Samuel was the last of the judges and the first of the prophets. 
Verse 33, who through faith subdued kingdoms? We're talking about those in verse 32. Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouth of lions, subdued. That word literally means to conquer, conquered kingdoms. Joshua the judge and David the king. And he talked about the wrought the righteousness, referring to the righteous kings. And we, there were a number of righteous kings in the southern kingdoms. Y'all remember, and this is not a historical lesson this morning. It's about what took place in the nation of Israel when they split. There was a northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. The northern kingdom had ten of the tribes of Israel. The southern kingdom had only two. But of all of the kings in the northern kingdom, there was never one righteous king. Not all of, all of them. They all ungodly, unrighteous kings. They turned to idolatry. They turned to pagan worship and such as that. Only some kings in the southern kingdom, such as David and Solomon and Asa and Josephat and uh, jo Josiah and kings like that. Hezekiah was a good one. But he went on to say in verse 34, Quench the violence of the fire and escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness were made strong, wax valiant and fight, turn to the fight, flight of the armies of the aliens. He's describing all that these things, all these kings had done. Talks about the three Hebrew children. Uh, talks about escape the edge of the sword. That's talking about David and, and Elijah and Elisha. Out of the weakness were made strong. He's talking about Gideon and Samson and Hezekiah. He says in verse 36, And others had trial of cruel mockings, scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawed asunder. Uh, it's believed that Isaiah was sawed in half by a wicked king. They were sawed asunder, were tempted were, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute and afflicted and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And all these, having obtained a good report through the faith, received not the promise. Notice verse 40. God, having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. Talking about perfect in their faith or complete in their faith. Here's, here's what I want you to understand. One thing out of these verses. All that these people did. All of these heroes, whether it be men or women. And how they were recognized. How they were remembered because of their faith in God and what God done. We need to never be we need to be careful never ever to forget those that were that were willing to pay the ultimate price that you and I could do what we do today. Otherwise we could not do what we do today. And the same heritage that these men in scripture has handed down through all these centuries, there's men in America that's also handed down so that you and I could do what we do today. Guys, Jake and Jack, y'all need to understand, y'all couldn't do what y'all do today. Y'all couldn't go play in a high school game today without men and women had laid down the ultimate price that y'all could do what y'all do today. Sometimes we lose sight of all that. Sometimes we forget of the ultimate price that was paid that we could do what we do in our hearts and lives. Father, I, I pray for these few minutes that we're going to take today. Lord, that you'll help us to remember and never soon forget the price that was paid that we can do what we do today in America. But Lord, ultimately, I pray that people would not lose sight of the price that you paid that we could enjoy what we enjoy this day. We'll thank you, Father, for what you'll do in Christ's name. Amen and amen. To me, holidays are such a part of being an American. I don't know how y'all perceive it. I don't know how you look at it. There are about 10 or 12 major holidays that we celebrate in America. And for the, for the most part, though not all because of family circumstances and holidays, 
they're, they're, most of our holidays are about family and they're about food and they're about fellowship and they're about fun and they're great. I, I don't know. I just, I, I look forward to them. And I'm sure that not everybody knows the meaning and the story behind all of the holidays that we celebrate. I, I think that probably most people understand Christmas. Most people understand what Easter's about and such as that. Um, some, I don't know that most understand what Thanksgiving is, is about. It didn't have its beginning with most of us eating too much turkey and watching football. That's not really what Thanksgiving is all about. Actually, uh, Thanksgiving, uh, the holiday dates back to 1621, the year that after the Puritans had arrived in, in Docton, Massachusetts, that they determined to practice the freedom of their religion. That's the reason that they came from England and came to America so that they could practice their freedom of religion. And the very first winter that they were here, there was a number of them, about half of those that landed that particular time, about half of them died. And then the following winter, because of the help of some local Indians that taught the Puritans how to plant corn and how to survive during the winters and such as that, when that took place, that following year, the Puritans invited them over in order to celebrate a thanksgiving for the, for the kindness that they showed to them. We also enjoy what's known as the 4th of July or Independence Day that we enjoy. This honors the nation's birthday uh, that was back in July the 4th, 1776. And if I were to ask y'all, how old is America today? Would most of y'all know? 248 years old will be this coming year. I don't have time to deal with all of the holidays, nor is this message really about all of the holidays. But I do want you to understand how tomorrow's holiday, Memorial Day, came about. I shared this with my Sunday school class, and I think it's important that, that we get this. Our, our present commemoration of this holiday came out of what was known as the Civil War back in 1865. And shortly after the close of the war, there were some women in Vicksburg, Mississippi, that they chose May the 30th as the day to place flowers on the graves of those that had died in the Civil War, which was a commendable thing. The practice of choosing a special day to decorate the graves of the war dead soon spread both to north and south, and it came to be called Declaration Day. And then in 1868, uh, there was a group of women in Washington, D.C., they asked permission of the War Department to decorate the graves at Arlington National Cemetery and to be allowed to have a special memorial ceremony marking that particular occasion. After a lot of discussion, permission was granted, but the officials attached a harsh provision. No flowers were to be able to be placed on the Confederate graves. You can put it on the Union graves, but you cannot put it on the Confederate graves. They had their ceremony. As a matter of fact, General James Garfield, who was a voted Christian, was the one speaking at that particular occasion. After he delivered his message, and after everybody had left, the cemetery was, nobody else was there at the cemetery. They say, it's recorded in, in, in the Annals of History, that there was a great wind came across the cemetery that particular day after everybody had left. And that wind blew all of the flowers that they had placed on the Union graves, and they blew them, every one of them, over on the Confederate graves. And when that took place, word got around of what had taken place, and they looked at that as a sign from God saying, we better honor both of them. So nowadays... When we have that particular Memorial Day, we honor both the North and the South. I got to thinking as I was putting together this message, I thought about the families who may have had people who served in the military that maybe they paid the ultimate price. We have a, we have a little saying around here, nothing is really important until it becomes personal. 
And, and, I, and I thought about that. It becomes real personal real fast when you have a loved one that's in the military and they're away somewhere. They're serving somewhere. They're protecting you. They're protecting me. So it becomes real personal when it becomes home to us. Our military men and women are willing to sacrifice whatever may be asked of them so that we can do what we're doing today. You know, I, I thought about this. All of our men, men and women in the military don't die. But all of our men and women in the military are willing to die for you and for me. And I think that's something we need to never lose sight of. So what we say every Memorial Day is what the, the writer of Hebrews is saying in principle is what he's trying to get across. He's saying you are not forgotten for what you did for the faith that we enjoy today. All of the stories and all of the history behind those that's listed in Hebrews chapter number 11 is the fact that you and I can enjoy what we enjoy today. The fact that we come to know Christ as Savior because they're willing to pay the price that we can do what we do today. And that's something that we ought to shout about just like the song says. We ought to be able to raise our hand and thank God for what God's done in our hearts and lives. Hebrews 11 is often referred to as a heroes of faith chapter. These men and women demonstrated their faith in God and made a difference in the lives of other people. And when you come to chapter number 12, he's saying, remember those who changed their world and go and do likewise. That's basically exactly what he's trying to convey in chapter 11 and 12. And time won't let us permit to consider all of these heroes of faith, but one weapon they all had in common. You read it all the way through chapter 11. They had one weapon in common. That one weapon is a weapon of faith. If you can learn and I can learn to trust God, have faith in God, no matter what we face in life, we can get through whatever we need to go through in life. So let's take just a minute. Let's consider faith on the thought, or on the thought of Memorial Day and make application for today. Number one, their faith in the miraculous intervention of God in the affairs of man. Let me say that again. Their faith in the miraculous intervention of God in the affairs of men. You know, we always seem to equate faith with something tangible, something that, that we can see, something that maybe we can touch. For instance, you know, we, we consider great faith when we see a blind man give us, get his sight back. He had great faith. Or the lame to walk, or the list could go on. But have you ever considered the miracle of faith in a circumstance where God had to show up in order for it to take place. Think with me for just a minute, okay? It had to take place in order for, for God had to show up in order for it to take place. I, I, I read this uh, article, or a story actually, it's a real story. There was a uh, blind girl, uh, and she was caught in a fire. She was in a high-rise building. She was on about the ninth or tenth store of this high-rise building. And uh, she, was, she, she had lost her, her, her sight, and uh, she was there by herself. She couldn't make her, her way, you know, uh, out of the building in time. She felt the heat behind her. She knew that, that time was, was against her. And she went to the, to the edge at the window. She opened the window and such as that. And she could hear those down below hollering at her, Jump! Just jump. We've, we've got, we're ready for you. Just jump. She kept hearing the fireman talk about jumping. The fireman said, if you don't jump, you're going to die. Take the risk and jump. You know, it's bad enough to jump from 10 stories high, but to jump when you can't see what you're jumping into. In the midst of the chaos and all of those firemen hollering, she kept hearing those firemen holler. But all of a sudden, she picked out one voice, and she heard this voice say this, Jump, baby. Just jump. I got you. And the little girl said, Daddy, is that you? And she said, he said, Yes, baby. It's me. You can jump. And lo and behold, she jumped out, 
And Christ is the same way. Christ is inviting us to jump. He knows that we're nervous. He knows that we're scared to jump, but we just need to learn to jump. Remember, we're talking about we're talking about jumping into the arms of Christ. I read this other story. It's not the same kind of story. But there was a man one time slid over the side of a cliff. And just before he was falling all of this distance down, he grabbed a hold of a branch. Just barely got, got, grabbed a hold of this branch. And he was dangling over this cliff hundreds of feet high. And he, he screamed out, Help me, somebody help me. And there was a voice came out of the sky. Do you believe that I can help you? The man responded, yes, I believe. Please help me. And the voice came out of the sky again. Do you believe that I have the power to help you? Yes, I believe, I believe. Please help me. Do you believe I love you enough to help you? Yes, I know you love me. Please help me. Oh, please help me. And the voice came out again and says, Oh, because you believe, I will help you. Now let go. And there was a long pause. And the man that was hanging there said, after a brief silence, Is there anybody else up there? You know. <laughs> and sometimes I think that's basically the way that we are. We want, we want to see a faith, something that we can see. I want you to look in your Bible. If you look at chapter 11, look what he says. Go back to verse number 7. It says, By faith Noah, being warned of God of things not seen as yet, moved with fear, preparing an ark to the saving of his house, by the which he condemned the world and became heir of righteousness, which is by faith. I don't know how y'all are when you get to heaven. I don't know who you want to meet first, but Noah is one of the, on the top of my list of people that I'd love to sit down and talk with. Noah believed God that God was, was going to do something that had never done before, you know, uh, because Noah's faith and his family, uh, Noah followed the, the instruction of God. You have to understand when when God told Noah, Noah, I want you to build an ark. I want you to build a boat. Well, you know, that sounds good to you and that sounds good to me, but the thing you have to understand, it had never rained up to that time. And he was asking him to build this ark out in a deserted place where there's no water whatsoever, but God said, I want you to build it. And I, I, I was wondering as I was reading through these this portions of Scripture, Noah's faith impacted his family. There wasn't but eight people saved during the flood. There was Noah, Miss Noah, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their wives, a total of eight people. And Noah's faith impacted his family. And I thought about that. I thought, does your faith impact your family? Does your faith that you say that you have, does it make a difference in those that are watching you? And or will your faith impact other people? If you look again in Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go into a place where he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed and went out not knowing whether he went. In other words, he didn't know where he was going. Verse 9. By faith he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in the tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob and his heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which had foundations, whose builder and maker is God. Through faith also Sarah herself received strength to conceive seed and was delivered of a child when he was past and when she was past age. Because she judged him faithful, who also had promised. Therefore sprang there even of one and him as good as dead. You know what that means? <laughs> Abraham, when all this took place, Abraham was 99 years old. He says he was good as dead. There wasn't nothing going to take place. And Sarah wasn't far behind him. But by faith, they did exactly what God had asked them to do. Verse 12, 
Therefore sprang, sprang there even of one, and him as good as dead, so many as the stars of the sky and the multitude, and as the sand which is by the seashore, innumerable. Keep your finger there. Go back a few pages to the book of uh, Romans for just a second. I want to show you something. Romans chapter 4. Abraham never wavered in believing all the promises that God had given him, ever. And that's one of the reasons that the Jewish people are so powerful today. In Romans chapter 4, look if you would at verse 20. He, that means Abraham, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, in being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform. And therefore, it was imputed to him for righteousness. Now, it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him. You ought to underline that word imputed, impute. I'll explain it in just a second, to impute. Now, it was not written for his sake alone. That means it was for me and you today that it was imputed to him. But for us also to whom it shall be imputed, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus, our Lord, from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. To impute is a, is a banking term. Most of y'all know. You've heard me explain it. It's a banking term which literally means to apply to one's account. The faith that Abraham demonstrated the day that God told him, he said, Abraham, I want you to get up. I want you to leave. I want you to go to a land that I will show you. You don't know where you're going, but I'll show you where to go. And Abraham picked up everything that he had. He trusted God. He believed God. But not only there did he go, but Abraham continued to believe God and all that God said and God told him, he says, Abraham, I'm going to impute your faith to your account. And what that means is simply this. To impute means to place on one's account. You get paid Friday, okay? And you get paid for the week's work that you did. They take your check. They either hand it to you in an envelope or they direct deposit. But either way, what you did is applied to your account. What he's saying there is simply this. Abraham's faith in God, God took the faith that Abraham demonstrated and applied all of his faith to his account of righteousness of God on Abraham's account. God said, I'll take all that you've got, you put it on my account because you're too broke to pay what you owe, spiritually speaking. Did you know if you're here this morning and you know that you know Christ is your personal Savior. Did you know that all of the righteousness of Jesus Christ was placed on your account because you were too broke spiritually to pay what you owe? The Bible says that your righteousness, the best that you can do, the very best that you can do is like filthy rags. And every bit of the righteousness of Jesus Christ was placed on your account the moment that you put your faith and trust in him and him alone. Not in church membership, not in baptism, not in trying hard, not in sincerity, not in good works, but in Christ and Christ only. There is no other way of salvation other than what's found in our relationship with Christ. So Noah believed God and he believed what God said and he obeyed building something the world thought was too crazy to build. Abraham followed God and did exactly what God said. You say you, 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 you say, you believe in God? Yeah. Do you have enough faith to trust God? Let me, let's put it like this. Let's make it a little bit more personal. You say you have faith. I have faith, preacher. I trust God. Do you have enough faith in what God's Word teaches to build your marriage on that faith? A lot of people say, I've got faith and I trust God. Well, are you willing to do things God's way? Do you have faith to trust God? You know, do you have trust that God will, will take care of your soul for eternity? Do you trust him with your finances? Do you, do you, do you believe he's enough God to, to take care of you in your life? 
let, let's put it simple. Let's put it this way. Does God have priority in your life? Something has priority in your life. Someone has priority in your life. Maybe it's your finances. Maybe it's your 401K. Maybe it's your activities. Maybe it's your church membership. Whatever it may be. What are you trusting in to get you to heaven? Faith in Christ is the only thing. So Noah, by faith, built for God. Abraham, by faith, walked for God. Not only have faith in the miraculous intervention of God, let me give you the second thing. It's a faith that honors God even in the face of great obstacles. Look at our text again. Go back to Hebrews 11. Look what he says in verse 23. When he talks about the obstacles that we face in life. It says in verse 23, By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months by his parents because they saw that he was a proper child. That word proper means a beautiful child. Pretty to look at. He was a favored child. Okay? So, because they saw that he was a proper child, and they were not afraid of the king's commandments. By faith, Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season, Stephen, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasure in Egypt, for he had respect unto the recompense of reward. By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Now, he's just simply talking about the faith that Moses demonstrated when he realized what was taking place in the life of his children, or life of his people, the Jewish people. Verse 23, if you look at it again, it speaks of the faith of Moses' parents. It was their faith in God that gave them the courage to go against Pharaoh's command and hide their child. The Pharaoh in those days would be like the president in our days. They went contrary to what Pharaoh said. They went contrary to what the president said. They're going to raise their children God's way. And that's exactly what you and I could learn today. Verses 24 and 25, Moses had enough faith to identify himself with God's people. I think that's a great lesson we all can learn. How many of God's people choose the world's way and not the ways of God? You say, well, how do I know the difference? The Bible talks about it in Romans chapter 1, verse 16. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Are you ever ashamed of the gospel? You ever ashamed of your relationship with Christ? Are you ever ashamed to bow your head and say grace when you're out in public? You say, well, I, I taught my kids, say, now we're not going to eat. Wait a minute. We're not going to eat until we pray. Let's thank God for our meal. Would you get out in public? Oh, I, I don't know that I can do that. I just, you have what we call the, the napkin prayer. You know what the napkin prayer is? <laughs> you're sitting at a table getting ready to eat. You're at a fine, fine restaurant, people all around. And you know you got your kids sitting here and your husband or wife or whatever, wife sitting there. And it's really time to pray. They brought the food. They set it down. And you know what you ought to do. Here's the napkin. Oh, I dropped my napkin. Lord bless the food. Thank you for the food today. Pick it back up. All right, we prayed. We're good. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it's the power of God. Don't be ashamed of Christ. I think a great lesson of faith that we learned about Moses was he feared Pharaoh so little because he feared God so much. That's a great lesson we all could learn. And then in verse 27, seeing him who is invisible. Is that not what faith is all about, being able to see him who is invisible? That's what chapter 11, verse 1 is about. Question. Let me ask you a question. When was the last time you demonstrated faith in the face of great obstacles? Think with me for just a minute. The entire nation of Israel was impacted at the result 
of one man, Moses. Can you imagine what an impact that your life can have just in your family when you're willing to demonstrate faith, to trust God, when you go contrary to everything else that the world's got to offer? Who sees your faith in face of obstacles and is compelled to believe God and God's word if you can stick by it? How's, let me, let's put it this way. How's your faith impacting your family and your friends, those that you work with, those that you play ball with, those that whatever you do with? How's your faith impacting them? We are the best Christians somebody knows. They're watching your walk. They're watching your talk. They're watching how you live your life. And your life is impacting people in one way or the other. It's just what you choose to do with your life. Do they see your faith in action? Or are you just like the world around them? They don't see any difference. I think that's one of the reasons that Paul said what he did in Romans chapter 12 and verse 2. He said, and be not conformed to this world, but be you transformed. The word conformed in Romans 12 too means to be pressed into the mold of. When my kids were, were young, my, my boys were little, just like many of yours, they had that Play-Doh. You remember the Play-Doh? You'd mash that Play-Doh and it'd get everywhere. But with the, when you bought the Play-Doh thing, they would give you little uh, like stars that you could press down in that Play-Doh. And, and when you raise it up, it looked, the Play-Doh looked like a star or a circle or oval. That's exactly what he's saying there. Be not conformed to this world. Don't be pressed into the mold of this world, but be you transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind. How? By the Word of God. It's God's Word that will make your mind new. It's no wonder to me that so many believers who profess to be believers are so much like the world because they've not allowed the Word of God to get into their mind, into their thinking. Because, one, look here, once the Word of God gets into your mind, it gets into your heart. Once it gets into your heart, it gets into your feet. And once it gets into your feet, you ain't the same. God changes our life. Satan will come along and he'll whisper in your ear, you know, live that way and the people's going to laugh at you. But God comes right along and says, live by faith and trust me and I'll put a smile on your face. Don't worry about what others think. Worry about what you and God are doing. Amen. So what have we learned about the faith of those who gave their lives for what was right? Well, just like a good soldier, we've seen the miraculous intervention of God in the affairs of men. That's certainly seen in Noah and Abraham. Secondly, a faith that honors God even in the face of great obstacles. That was seen in the life of Moses. Let me give you the last one I'm through. Is a faith that holds believers steady in the face of hostile circumstances. And I believe with all of my heart, folk, America has reached the place of hostile circumstances. You're fixing to find out what your faith is all about. You're fixing to find out. It hasn't got anything to do with the election coming up. It doesn't matter to me who gets elected. There's an all-out war going on in America for the faith of believers. And you're going to fix them to find out what your faith is all about or lack thereof. You'll notice in our text in verses 11, uh, chapter 11, verse 35 through 38, it says, Women receive their dead husbands or their dead life again. I think this was referring to the widows of Zarephath. And the woman at Shunem that received their children. And then the latter part of verse 35 through verse 38. By faith these people who only God knows their names were able to face unbelievable torture and suffering for the sake of Christ. Let me close with this. But the ultimate sacrifice that was given is found if you look at chapter 12. Verse number one, follow along with me. 
You have to keep in mind the context of the book of Hebrews, okay? Hebrews was written to those that were going through tremendous, tremendous persecution. As a matter of fact, the persecution was so great in the life of some believers that this letter was written to, they were going back into Judaism. They were turning their back from the church and going back into Judaism because of the pressure and because of all that they were going through. They had uh, at one time forsaken Judaism and followed Christ, but things were getting so difficult on them. Notice what he says in verse number one. Wherefore, seeing we are so com compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that set before us. I want you to notice something in verse number one. Rather than they were, they were, they were being encouraged by the witnesses of verse number one. This wasn't per se uh, uh, a bunch of people sitting around and encouraging them to keep on. What it was, it was a testimony of those, you and I, it was a testimony for you and I to keep going about the faithfulness of God in our lives today, how faithful God is to you and how, God, how faithful God is to me. Because those people were saying, he's faithful. Noah was, Noah was saying, he's faithful. Moses was saying, he's faithful. Abraham was saying, he's faithful. The Word of God says, he's faithful. Just left up to you and I what we're going to do with what we know as far as the Word of God is concerned. But I want you to notice one thing, and I'll wrap it up. If you'll notice in verse number one, laying aside every weight and the sin which thus so easily beset us. Now, the sin could apply to a lot of different things. Personally, I believe the sin he's talking about there is the sin of unbelief or the lack of faith is what he's trying to get across there. And I think as we run this race of life, we've got to keep our eyes focused on Christ and Christ only. And I close with this thought. Memorial Day is a legacy that faithful soldiers left and are leaving even to this day. Faith is also a legacy. What was left to us to follow in the Word of God is left for us to leave to others by the lives that we live. You know, uh, I'm the kind of individual, I don't know about y'all, I'm kind of an individual. When, when I buy something new, if I buy uh, a tool, well, let me, let me, if I buy a table, you know, let's say a little card table, then I throw away the instructions how to put together. Just like every man, I just throw them away. I don't need that. I'm good. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. Okay. And about seven hours later, I try to find the box. Because if I can find the box, it's got the picture of the table, I can put it together. I just need a picture. That's all I need. I don't need all of those step one, step two, because... They have an engineer write those directions that's never put a table together in his life. He's never seen a table before in his life. He uses words that I can't pronounce. But you show me that picture. It's kind of like that, that, that flag. Ain't that cool flag? I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, we got that last week in High Wash here, a week before last. I look, at that, I look at that flag. I know what that flag stands for. I, I understand it, okay? It stands for the freedom that I enjoy, the liberty that I enjoy. It stands for the fact that, that men gave their, that shed their blood that we might enjoy what we enjoy today. Every time that I look at the flag, I have a real problem with anybody that desecrates the flag. Real problem, okay? Uh, and, and, and I look at that flag... But my, my, my thought is, he closed Hebrews 11 out, talking about Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, 
by the example that we see, by the example that you leave. Let, let, me, let me put it like this. Let's say, for instance, Michael, I'll pick on you for just a minute, okay? And I'm through. Michael is going to leave an example. Uh, he has really been working a lot with uh, Clay. Uh, he's a good friend of Clay. Clay was one of the young men that, that was uh, carrying the flag this morning. He has sacrificed his time. I'm not saying sacrifice. He's given his time to encourage him. Uh, Clay doesn't have a man in his life, and he's just really been a friend to him, okay? And uh, stepped up and did that. Now, I, I'm, I don't know whether he realizes this or not, but I can promise you one thing. That boy will never forget you. He'll never forget the example that you set. He'll never forget the faith that you demonstrated, ever. I have a young man that, that made a difference in my life growing up. What my daddy. I wish it had been, but it wasn't. This young man, he and I, we grew up together. We were like brothers. He went into the Green Beret. He was uh, special forces and such as that. But his life impacted my life so much that had he been stupid, I would have been stupider, if that is a word. I don't know if that's a word. Because I would have stepped in his, I would have walked right after him. Promise you. That's the impact he had on my life. That's the impact that you have. But watch this, and I'm through. That's the impact we all have. We all are an example of faith in some capacity. Big or little. We're it. We're leaving the legacy of faith to the next generation. We can either water it down or we can enjoy it, one or the other. Father, I guess we could go on and talk more and more about the importance of faith, and it is vital. God, if we don't carry faith into this next generation, they're not going to have it. And Lord, I pray for those in this room this morning. Number one, the Bible says, not the preacher, the Bible says, faith cometh by hearing. Hearing by the word of God. The Bible says, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So, Lord, I've, I've done my best to tell people that we're saved by the grace of God. We're saved by faith in Jesus Christ because it's not what I think. It's what God's word says. And if there's anybody in this room that's trusting in anything other than Jesus Christ and his shed blood upon the cross of Calvary, they'll die and go to hell. There is no other way to heaven other than through Christ and Christ only. Moses, Abraham, Elijah, and the list goes on, left a legacy for us to read about, to study about, to follow. Help us to leave a legacy for our children, our sons, our daughters, our friends, whatever it may be, that they too would desire the Savior that we enjoy. For that we're grateful. In Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. Let's stand.